Welcome to Local Everywhere. My guest today is Dan Platt, and he is a the uh, an integral part of WCAA in in Albany, uh, New York. And WCAA is a low power FM station. So, Dan, uh, how did you hear about WCAA, and why did you want to get involved? So the, the my story starts in college, uh, being educated uh, and trying to figure out what my worldview is. So I tabled a lot, did outreach, political activism, joined the Occupy movement, and that led into other types of political action, like running for office. And what I enjoyed the most was interacting with people, having conversations, and uh, and, and being interviewed. So because it gave me a chance to think about what I really wanted to like, if I was asked this question, how would I answer it? And this occurred in well, while tabling every time. Uh, so it was definitely a dynamic I enjoyed. It was about talking to a lot of people at once, but over amount of time. And so uh, a lot of media has to do with that. So uh, as I ran for office, what I found was that just like there are food deserts, and other types of job deserts or economic lack of opportunity. There, there are media deserts, and we have a really lack of good journalism because of the core of uh, commercialism of it, and uh, or even on nonprofit sector, it's 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 for specific constituencies that can support it financially. We need a more diversity of media and the ability to do on the ground gr grassroots journalism. Uh, so that's what I found when I ran for office. And so along with being a podcast listener and maybe like, like anyone wanting to think about doing it themselves. Um, but as I did interviews, it's like, you know what? I actually could do this uh, interviews of yourself. In fact, like this. Mm. And, and this led me to, you know, but I didn't want to do it alone on the internet, like any other podcaster, even though maybe they have a staff or they do it with multiple people uh, or a streamer. Uh, I wanted it to be more collective, more collaborate. You know, I wanted it to be local also. You know, there's no such thing as a localist podcast because there's just not enough. Because when you're on the internet, your audience is everybody, not mm -hmm. just your locality. It's not constrained to the physical, the material. So thus, I, I wanted to be part of a community project. And so I, I was shopping around for a few years uh, for different community projects. And one of the things that came up was the first outreach for producers for WCAA done by Musa. And and then there was the grassroots radio conference. So I attended that. And that's what got me interested in what was happening. Grand Street It was my introduction to that organization as the station is part of that. It's a program of it. It's not separate. It's part of a whole. So the station should be taken as a part of a whole, which is a community radio, uh, sorry, community arts mm -hmm. center uh, that is in its mission statement, you focused. So there's there's those priorities as well. So sometimes there's like what this station should be or what we envision it. I personally, my personal agenda, but there is in fact a mission statement and a wider organization that I'm working under. So my current position is that of a programming tech. My responsibility is just making sure that the programming is happening and it's on the air. Um. So what is the second part of the question was how I got involved or, mm -hmm. and so I was, my involvement was being a producer, doing my talk show for two hours once a week, three left show. Uh, and I was keen because I was doing other community projects. I was trying to do at least two at a time uh, because there's just so many cool things to be interested in uh, gardening, community gardening, or other or housing issues, organizing political action. So I want to be able to do multiple things, but that can also be a de detriment and lead to burnout. Uh, but doing the show was enough, especially as for a bit I was part time, so I could really do a lot of energy into it. But that hasn't been the case since 2020, actually, uh, or 2021. Actually, 2022, but, you know, just two years ago. And but as uh, we had uh, various managers of the station who were also producers, things were pretty chaotic and we weren't growing like we could, but at least we were existing and sometimes we'd get compliments for how well we were run. And 
Uh, so eventually I needed to step up as being the person who's keeping the lights on, keeping the programming running. And the very least, that is the limit of the capacity that I could have or should have in the organization. That is Grand Street. But your your role right now in WCAA is quite a lot. I mean, you you have a lot on your plate with it. Um, I, I have been the last year, but um, at least thinking like thinking I'm doing it all, but I'm really not. And so I think a realistic turn is to say, look, I, I'm, I can be responsible for this. Going beyond that has been an issue and I haven't been able to uh, over the last year. So I think it's less stressful for me, you know, lower, lower the expectations a little bit. Um, expectations lead to suffering. You know, that's Buddhism 101 um and do what you can and what i can do is keep the programming running and it's what i enjoy doing because it involves training new producers uh because that is so my role right now is you know yes the programming the training of new producers and some of the comms um but that is that's it at the moment so i've kind of stepped back in a way but more just functionally just just as far as what i'm saying i'm doing actually um we need others to step up and join the station or of Grand Street to manage the station. People who aren't really interested in producing a show, but are certainly uh, know enough about radio or audio or just, or actually just a good organizer. I can teach them, you know, what they need to know um, to be that kind of middle person between Grand Street, the organization and the station, which is a program, you know, we need a program director essentially. Um, mm -hmm. But it's all volunteer, so that's that's been an issue ongoing. Mm -hmm. So the all volunteer concept, nobody's paid. Does that that I know of that you know of that has that inhibited the growth of WCAA? Because a lot of people don't want to put X number of hours into a into a specific thing that they know they're not going to get remuneration for. So has that been a problem with WCAA? It's been a problem. Um, there's a general ideological pushback that I would give that people are willing to do a certain amount of social labor, right? It's it's more what they're able to do, not what they can do um, or, or would be motivated to do, right? You know, we don't always do things for pay. We're not homo economicus all the time, you know, only acting in our commercial self-interest. But there's also bills to pay. We don't live in a uh, com communistic world. So the, or communitarian world where everything's kind of taken care of communally. Mm -hmm. But we, there, there are reasons for the, not being all volunteer. You know, if you have a paid staff, you can fall into traps of certain nonprofits where you get mission creep. Um, you take on more and more and eventually you're not really doing what you were originally founded to do, or you get certain forms of corruption, um, embezzlement, you know, it's, you, you kind of get the problem that say the commercial bids have the business improvement districts or other nonprofits where they, they may have a paid staff and, but they're not as, even as effective as they could be, um, because maybe they're not there to be motivated well i mean would you take the job for lower pay if it's not motivated so there are various sociological questions not getting into that but it has been an, an inhibitor um we certainly need but i think it can be done all volunteer it just we just there just needs to be a various delegation of responsibilities so that everyone is only doing no more than 10 hours a week uh with their involvement and being a producer is five to ten hours a week i mean depending on what kind of work you're doing if you're just a dj it's really just a, a few hours um i was spending at least 10 hours doing a two-hour talk program because i was also editing it after and that would take a few hours but uh in the writing and whatever it depends on how intense it is right but you know you want to limit people's the ask to a certain amount of time mm -hmm. and if someone can manage the station uh, you know have various people involved um then it could be all volunteer but you need a certain level of involvement of number of people. You need a mass. So, so that that's my assessment at the moment. So, you know, a lot of people do podcasting. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I would say that community radio is, uh, or low power stations, is not as well known. Mm-hmm. What do you see as the difference, and what do you what do you think is is more or less better? Well, as I interact, and as we have been doing more tabling over the summer, and we'll be doing a few more events in the winter, um, special events that the public is generally interested and not pessimistic about what what is better or not. Uh, I think they can see that there is a need for more diversity of of options, that streams, uh, like there's there's online radio stations, uh, they have a particular name, and they can cross-pollinate with us. Like one of our new producers was someone who was on such a stream, a live stream, uh, where it's a radio and they they organized it. A community organized it and they can cross pollinate to reach a wider audience because that's what we provide a wider platform that can reach more people outside of the siloed communities that the internet actually kind of creates everyone can see or reach depending on the algorithm of course every you know all the options maybe but the community project being physical having a place having a physical space being a place where people can meet and work together and learn uh, to, regardless of educational attainment or background that we can accommodate various backgrounds if we put in the effort. That allows for a type of community and action and possibilities that being online actually doesn't because uh, the last decade I've seen over and over or just continuously um, communities of creators who are not really working together. They're they're either competing for audience share. Sometimes they can they can work together as far as like a funnel of content that leads people to a certain like action or, or something like that. Um, or there's entertainment and it's just pure you know con- uh, time wasting or time uses usage. But I wanted something more and I wanted to work with people in my uh, physical area. And that's what this project and community radio allows for. Uh, Even though, even though we're terrestrial with a radio signal that has a limited reach uh, or span, you know, you're not going to have it on in your car unless it's on your phone, since we do have a live stream for the, for the feed of the station. So we are available 24 seven anywhere you have an internet connection. Um, So we're not really limited by the radio even though we have all that equipment and a certain amount of capital was put into that. But, it, and I see that as an advantage in that we have a backup in case the internet goes down somehow. Uh, it is controlled or used, you know, there is a cartel system of how it's provided at the moment until we start set up community mesh networks, stuff like that. But otherwise it's Spectrum or Verizon's game if you're in Gilliland. And, and, and it's dependent on what you can pay, you know, the internet could be $50 for the first two years, but then it goes to $80 a month. Mm -hmm. Uh, Radio, you only need to buy, you know, a radio. So that, that's, that's its advantage. It really is all inclusive. And that's, that's a priority that we meet. But, you know, and we uh, can, and we can care about local issues and content more than just uh, an online thing could be. You, you broadcast a lot about, Albany Mm -hmm. and you were talking about streaming so if I took a trip let's say to Los Angeles Mm -hmm. I wanted to hear your show then even though I'm in Los Angeles I have the ability to listen to the stream so what I'm saying is Mm -hmm. even though it's a hundred watts yeah it's worldwide because of streaming Mm-hmm. Correct. Yes, and that we are an affiliate of the Pacifica Network, which is a nation and in North America, I think, network of community stations, um, and that's dozens and dozens strong. I think there's like eighty of them at least, maybe a hundred, and that allows us to share content with them, and we they share content with us. We have a shared platform that we use, uh, which is accessible to us, and so that's that's further connections as well as, you know, we can, a lot of the content that's shared is non-local, 
Um, but that's sort of what I think is could, we could be really different is that we do more hyper local content. Mm -hmm. And one of our new producers is has integrated that in his show because he does local programming at libraries. He does meetups for kids and families. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he likes promoting that. And that's the show is partly that as well as playing music because he is a DJ, too. Do you um, think do you think that the fact that you stream in a lot of um shows from Pacifica, would you say that was one of the reasons is because uh local talent in this area has not been identified to to uh come on WCAA. What do you think? It's certainly amount of work like you need, like I said, there needs to be a delegation of roles and to have a separate person doing the talent scouting. That's its own job. Um, and it's a job we haven't fully been able to do. So we've been kind of the halfway measure is doing outreach where you meet people halfway. You go where lots of people are and then maybe they'll come to you and talk to you. And it's a way of we're going out to talk to them. And, you know, so there is the direct outreach of canvassing, like a list of places that might have someone interested in doing a show. And whenever I talk to people in public, I'm always mentioning at the station and like, oh, especially if they're part of an organization, maybe your org would be uh, interested in making content. Uh, nothing too small. Nothing is too small. You can make something that's just 10 minutes, updates, whatever. It could go into kind of a local smorgasbord. Um, or you could maybe develop a whole show. Um and and so there's some interest but obviously not a lot of commitment but it's certainly out there and there are lots of people interested in doing various things maybe they just haven't gotten their feet wet yet so getting that getting people started and that means having training camps or just people need to be emotionally prepared to to, to you know to do something new as okay. that, that's just basic psychology i think that is when you're doing something new there's always a little bit of anxiety oh i don't know if i really want to try it or you are motivated but got to get around to it got to get pulled in um though at the same time unless it's a dedicated position or role sending out an email to add to, to to canvas people it's not something i can take on personally uh i don't have the the spoon so to say so to say um i can do so much with people who reach out to me but if they if they don't get back to me after a month, you know, and I send another email, it's uh, you know, it's like, okay, gotta move on. But um, but I always keep the contact information for later, maybe another year, they will be ready. Um, because people can express an interest, but say, well, not yet. A lot of people in that are in that stage. And you gotta meet people where they are, and that's a standard refrain. Um, and but there's definitely a lot of potential because there just isn't the platform. We provide a platform to do that because whether it's the the barrier of of buying the right mic uh, at home or having you know a good setup or having a good computer or or maybe your house is just not conducive for recording audio, um, taking that first step is is a, is a task, and we can facilitate that with the equipment we have and the community spirit of like, hey, we're here to help. And and uh, help people be more confident, as I have been with uh, one of our newest producers, who has a pretty unstable background, but uh, or unstable life, but uh, he can express himself with his show, and uh, it's helping him. One of the arguments for podcasting versus local uh, local radio uh, or community radio is. Mm -hmm. When people do podcasting, they say, well, we're not governed by the FCC, whereas if I did a community radio show, I would be. W what do you say about that argument? That's an argument for podcasting over doing a community project. Uh-huh. Well, when I reach out to podcasters, I haven't done too much of it, but it's on my to-do list. Uh, well, I'll, maybe I'll have a firmer answer, but what I've gotten so far is that people don't seem to think of that as an impediment. It can be the FCC guidelines of no adult, well, I mean, adult content is a matter of maturity, okay? It's not just a matter of using um, verboten language or uh, sexual content. Um, 
you want it to be accessible to everybody. And that means different levels of sensitivity and maybe even maturity as well. But that doesn't preclude you from making mature content, content for adults, because uh, that's kind of what my generation really likes content that could be animated or not but still treats people like adults whether even if it's even directed at kids it can still be mature enough that it's all ages and that's what you know it's, it's when content is too narrow and focused that it, it limits itself to its audience and, and and sort of that's how people have found niches and made a living out of it but that's not the same as doing hard journalism and providing people with information and knowledge and understanding to better act in the, our society, to be more engaged. A lot of content is actually, it feels like engagement, but it's a false engagement because it's entertainment or infotainment. We can be all of that too. You know, we play a lot of music. And also to your point about we, we do Pacifica content, that's kind of filler at the moment, but as more people come in, more producers, more volunteers, um, we are filling out the schedule so that eventually, I think only maybe a fraction of it will be much, uh, Pacifica content. Because some of it, I I personally want to keep. Some of it's really unique um, or the most unique things. But for example, there are Pacifica hip hop shows that we have in rotation. But as we have more producers who do hip hop shows, we will phase those out because we won't need them. Pacifica content allows us to have a good diversity of things. Um, but say the morning on the weekdays is all talk shows, news from various sources um, and perspectives. And the evenings will be more music, but with drive, you know, the rush hour uh, five to seven being news programming, like news scene, which is public meetings, recorded public meetings that we just play the audio from public meeting. Maybe not always the most recent meeting, but at least chosen by the producer who's doing it, ones that he feels are important. And for, and my show, which is a mix of my the content I made before, as well as reading local stories from the Times Union or the Business Insider and making doing my commentary on it. Because I'm also not at a I'm going out and finding the stories myself. Again, that's its own job. That should be, that's where a paid position is needed. You know, you know. So you talked about hip hop. One of the people on your, sh on your station mm -hmm. is Philip on the radio. And Philip does early, early rock and roll. That's right. And he is absolutely phenomenal. And there's, you know, there's still a lot of us baby boomers around, and we like yes. to listen to that stuff. We like to hear stuff from the, you know, 50s and pre-Beatles, and, and that it brings back memories of our childhood. And, you know, you talk about hip-hop, that's okay. But going back and catering to uh, baby boomers, I think, is a wonderful concept. Certainly. I always, as the programming tech, uh, I'm not, I'm also making programming decisions at the moment. Uh, again, until somebody comes in to make them, I'll hand it off and just be a producer because that's kind of my long-term goal perhaps, but we need more you know, people involved. Uh, at the moment I'm making programming decisions as well as the, you know, run it maintaining. And my decisions are definitely based on a want to keep balance, want to have things for all ages. You know, if the fifth person comes along wanting to do a hip hop show, I may actually turn them away or insist that they take an hour instead of a two hour slot. Most DJs need two hours. They do not feel that an hour is enough. And I get that because when I did my talk show, I felt like I couldn't fully go over a topic until I had two hours. And um, but I just didn't have the time for it eventually as mm -hmm. I work full time now. Mm -hmm. and and on that note yeah so so eventually i'm trying to balance between like you know what people are playing and how many i'll allow i'll have to say no eventually or at least try to make some constraints uh and stuff stuff like that or eventually i may i just say okay you can you can do another hip-hop show but it has to be in the a.m hours it's not going to be uh, but we have the archive so people can listen to a program 
if it's a music show, like a week before, and if it's a talk show, uh, months before. So when did the FCC starting uh, start granting licenses for low power FM stations? How many years ago? Do you know that? My working knowledge is that it was in 2011. There was a lawsuit. Um, that basically challenged the monopoly that commercial or nonprofit stations had on airwaves. The FCC is what you know. It's, it's the the spectrum of, of, is is more is way is limitless. You know because we're only using a fraction of what the frequency range could be. You know that you could have, right. uh, especially in any locality. And that's sort of the argument that in a locality, like you're not going to cover as wide an area, so you can use more of the frequencies that are available that are physically capable of being broadcasted. So there was really no functional argument for or, or public interest argument that could be made from the FCC side to limit uh, low power stations. And that, I think that was a compromise that we can have. We no longer need to be pirate radio stations. If you're going to be community or hyper local, you can just file and it's not that hard to get that license, or at least you get the provisional, and then you set up the equipment, and then and then you get the life full license. And it's it's really not that difficult, actually. Um, that's what's really cool about all this, and uh, and it's and it's led to an explosion of community radio stations, uh, over the last decade, and and uh, obviously we haven't seen its larger impact on society, but uh, like a lot of community projects, it's. Little drops of water uh, that carve the canyon. <laughs> right. So you're saying 2011. That's what I think it is. I, or right. it was in 2010. It was. It was. Okay. It was sometime uh, between 09 and 2013. Okay. So the uh, first first two decades after the the new century. Would mm -hmm. that that would be pretty pretty safe to say? So when did when did the proliferation of podcasting start? From your knowledge, well, to to be generalizing, I guess it's the same amount of time. You know, the growth of community broadcasting is in parallel with the ability to broadcast online, but. Podcasting started before in the early aughts, in, in the mid aughts. And obviously, I kind of came and laid my experiences when I started college in 06. And there was a certain amount there, but it was much more, it was still like in the early adopters phase, I think. And I think by 2010, 2011, it was definitely starting to get pick up where you had larger institutions and organizations making podcasts, news, uh, pot, the news channels, uh, larger institutions. So it's not being, it was grassroots production at first and it's still, you still have mom and pop podcasts, you know, anyone can start one as long as you buy rent the server space, uh, which is a requirement, you know, you can't start it with just nothing. You have to rent. So there is a certain cost involved, but it's, it's not always that much, uh, a few few dozen dollars a month, right? Um, so and which is why I also have server access, and I my show is also archived on my personal website. So what I my argument or my my question is, podcasting is a is more well known than low power FM stations. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, it reaches more people through the internet. And stations are local community entities, but they serve completely different functions. Instead of serving a wider and bringing people together across large distances, it's more about consolidating the people who are in a area or a geography to act together. But it also, even if I just, I made a podcast, see, I as I kind of mentioned, I podcast my program as well, but I'm able to do that because of the platform of the community station. I did not feel that I want, I want access to better equipment and I didn't want to spend at the time. 
I can afford it now. But at the time, I'm not going to put down hundreds of dollars to make a home studio. You know, I share an apartment with other people. Uh, I don't have, I, I would prefer a, a separate studio. Now, of course, there are like kind of private studios you can rent to do things. That's what musicians do. Um, but again, I wanted to do it with other people. I wanted to collaborate. I wanted the ability to have a place uh, to invite guests and have group discussions uh, in a community space rather than one's own home, because that's something you don't do. Otherwise, it's always, you know, the, the platform we're using now and the kind of interview styles. But the the medium sometimes makes the message. And if the message is we need to come together and do things communally or as a community uh, to make things we want to happen and have better lives, that doesn't really happen online. There have been so many efforts to organize, do political action, or what have you online. And it just doesn't work out. Um, there's only, it can only do so much. You can crowdfund, you can fundraise, um, you can, but it's it's always kind of geared towards funneling towards like a small individual or a business. Um, it's not really, it's not the, the dreams of the early techies who developed and, and were the early adopters of the internet it is is particular mindset and, and type of personality and there needs to be different media platforms for all people some people are bad with computers they're bad with uh uh working on the internet and and there needs to be an option for them too but it also is integrated with all of it as well it can do both yeah you talk about lo local stories now we we live in Albany, which is the seat of state government, mm -hmm. and in Albany, um, I live right around the corner from the Capitol, and the, the my argument is WCAA has not really done a lot about um, state news. Talk about. Mm -hmm. the, what the governor's doing, what the state legislators is doing. And I think that's an important component that has not been addressed on WCAA. There are certainly many areas uh, and things that this station, the Organization of Grand Street Arts, can do. Uh, one of the big limiting factors is the, what comes, like you, you need an order of operations. And at the moment, the focus of Grand Street Arts is rehabbing the church building that it operates in. It's in desperate need of renovation. And over the last year and a half, or at least last year, the funding has been acquired partly through the rescue funds and now another half million from the county to fully renovate the building. The pipeline is, it's this work is in the pipeline. And our kickoff for the construction for the basement uh, is this December 6th, actually. And that's during the day, 11.30 to 1. And that's big news because along with classrooms for arts classes and other programming and a multi-use space, there will be a space for the station. So we're going to, you know, a lot of things are on hold until we move down there and get more activated. But again, more people helping, the more that can be done. Uh, people can step up and be a programmer and make that content we just haven't found that right person yet and that takes a certain amount of effort outreach and planning so there's lots of to-do lists we can make uh and it's all kind of in the future as we develop and as we have developed in the last five years so dan we've gone on for quite a, uh have this conversation for quite a quite a while this morning so i will say it's been wonderful. It's a great conversation. And I hope to talk to other um, community radio stations and get their feedback about the impact that they're making in their localities. And I think overall, I think that would be a good mosaic of information in America if that's done. Um, yeah. So... Uh, I'm hoping to achieve that, but you have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, you're, uh, 
one other one other statement. Mm. I I I found found out about uh, WCA through you. We were sitting at a common council meeting. Mm-hmm. It handed me a card, a business card about WCA, and that's how I knew about it. Hmm. You know, that was a number of years ago. Yeah, I think it was one particular manager made business cards for the station. I must have had a, a, a amount in my pocket at the time. Right. I don't remember, but uh, I've been making some of my own for the station, but I made the mistake of uh, putting a title on it, which I shouldn't have done. But um, <laughs> uh, just have to cross it out, I guess. But um, but things are fluid. Things are changing. And I'm sticking for the, you know, I've been involved for five years now and there's a little bit of uh, with the, that bias where you have sunk cost fallacy, you know. Uh, I don't want to just let it, the effort I put in go, but it's not dead, and it is alive, and it is growing, and and that's that's I'm definitely motivated when I'm training new people and they are learning a new thing or they're just applying what they already know, and there's a pleasure and and even if it's just that our audience is just the combination of all of our individual producers. There is still cross pollination. It is greater than the sum of the parts. So if somebody wants to reach out to you, uh, you have a number of ways that they can do so. Can you tell us the contact info? So the main two ways that I can say offhand is that there is the Facebook page. That's our main social media use uh for the st- uh, for the station which is grand arts radio so you can type in wcaa grand arts radio you can also go to the website grandarts.org that's grandarts.org and the email for the station which is the one i'm seeing is wcaa at grandarts.org same domain mm-hmm. just with wcaa at in front of it very simple uh, there is a phone number. Uh, I do not have it in front of me, unfortunately. Um, but it's listed on the website. Is, it is available on those two places, yes. Okay, great. So you have been listening to Dan Plant, um, integral part of WCAA. Yeah. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is local everywhere. See, I got it right this time. And uh, if you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. And also I have created a new website called Digital Cynthia, in, Digital which, I have, in which I have all of my my uh, YouTube videos on there. So check it out. I'm going to be doing a lot, you know, this coming year, there's going to be a lot of things happening. So please check it out, Digital Cynthia. And thank you, Dan, for taking the time to be on Uh, local everywhere. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great day. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving. It's been a pleasure.